Elaine Marie Johnson MacArthur can see the world through rose-colored glasses. Not that she is naive about the realities of nature or the vicissitudes of the human condition, or that she is ignorant of injustices, deceptions, or social or moral evils. Far from it. But Elaine makes a purposeful and conscientious choice to see the good, to counter the bad with a vision for something better, to see beauty in the world and people, even if they disappoint or frustrate us, and even if they prove to be mean. Elaine chooses to see the divine in creation, purpose to our challenges, and something holy and refining in the most difficult personalities and circumstances. I am sure that her hope to seek out the good, that there is power in using our agency to find a higher purpose and meaning, led to her conversion to Christ and his restored church while a 20-year-old college student at the University of Granada in Spain. This desire to follow a trail to goodness wherever it may lead took her through the streets of Granada to seek out one Sunday morning the small little gathering of saints. It led, to her, led her to be open to the message of the sister missionaries who taught her in Spanish, so impactful that she was baptized five days later. It is one of those wow conversion stories you'll all want to hear. Elaine's parents had always taught her to be an independent thinker and to pursue truth with passion wherever it may lead, although her choice may have even come as a surprise to these very progressive parents, one an eventual state Supreme Court justice and the other a feminist artist psychotherapist. But they honored the depth of her spiritual and intellectual conversion and commitment. Once a member of the Church, there was more than a rose-colored world. Elaine was now filled with a brilliant light that has ever informed her very being. Her intimate discipleship with the Savior is real and true and grows ever more salient through the years. Her commitment to a prophetic and apostolic words never wavers. She is not just inspired and motivated by their counsels, but she acts. She acts very well. She, she uh, acts. She walks to the precipice and jumps, trusting in the clarity that ultimately and inevitably comes. Her dedication to inspired counsel also includes the revelations received by women who are her teachers, presidents, and leaders from the local all the way to the general officers. While she remains open to diverse perspectives and the range of human experience, her loyalty to the healing Christ draws together the richness of both variety and eternal truth. I have come to better comprehend the charity of Christ through my cherished companion, who suffereth long and envieth not, is not puffed up, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, beareth all things. If we are to one day see Christ as he is in all his resplendent charity, I have had the privilege of a pre-showing, a glimpse into this most divine quality, having lived with Elaine for 34 years. A popular adage that we should engage in random acts of kindness in part characterizes Elaine, but what she really does is engage in inspired acts of kindness. They are not random, but guided by the Spirit as she notices, reaches out, and ministers in quiet and gentle ways. How often, when I can't seem to find her, I can trust she was impressed to pick someone up to give them a ride, maybe all the way to the other side of the island, drop in for a timely visit, deliver a much-needed resource, or lend an ear during a vulnerable time. Our home over the years has become a free B and BLD, bed, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. For many in transition or just temporarily lost, sometimes they come for a couple days, sometimes for weeks, months, and sometimes years. Her rescue does not have time restrictions. She offers a quiet, spirit-informed resort with both physical and spiritual sustenance. Lane is no respecter of persons. Whether patiently serving the disabled one, who others have grown weary attending to, the one overwhelmed by linguistic or cultural shock and needs sympathetic encouragement, the one hurt by explicit or implicit racism, the obstinate and difficult personality who chases people away with offensive and shock value diatribes, but who Elaine ministers to for years and then holds close in her arms as she takes her last breath, or the rough boys she welcomes, feeds, speaks to kindly and intelligently, advocates for them, 
sometimes in courts, as they seek to take responsibility and change their lives. While others fear them, she loves them, and they affectionately call her auntie and mother. She will stop to laugh and play with a child, especially those she thinks may be lonely or shunned, and sit patiently to listen with interest to the elderly as they prepare for their mortal exit. She rescues the living and the dead. Through her family history research and temple work, she has now provided or facilitated the saving, ordinance for, saving ordinances for nearly a whole town of her relatives in Italy, and many others, and one you'll hear about today. She knows in the most personal and intimate ways there are more with us than against us. She cherishes the opportunity to inspire students to become competent in the languages we may speak and competent in the language of the Spirit. Her four children, grandsons, students, sisters in her Stake Relief Society, her Marshallese grandchildren, even one who will pray for us today, even strangers, trust her consistency, her faith to work mighty miracles, and a love that endures all things. Elaine is grateful for life, for invigorating doctrines, for freedom and agency, for repentance, for beauty, for people, for simple things that gladden the heart and inspire both the mind and the soul. But most of all, she is grateful for the Savior of her soul, to whom she seeks in every way to emulate. Wow. <laughs> Thank you, Philip. And Thank you to Emily and Daniel for the music, and to Kimeme and Dixie for the prayer, and President for leading us out. I'm grateful to be here. I'm glad to see you. I'm glad that you've gathered. I'm, I'm very much grateful for the gathering of the saints. And I hope that today um, the spirit will abound and, and somehow convey something meaningful to you through my words. Sisters and brothers, aloha. aloha. I have long been fascinated by seeds, how in the right conditions and in the process of time, they transform. They grow and push through the nurturing but opposing earth and unfold and emerge into the light and continue to grow and become. When a seed is planted in the ground in the right conditions, germination happens. Germination is the process in which a seed changes from a state of dormancy, just a seed, to a growing, living plant. A seed contains a tiny plant embryo, as well as all the nutrients an emerging plant needs to begin its growth. In order for this growth to happen, the seed needs the right environment. As you probably know, that environment includes the right combination of water, air, oxygen, and warmth, usually from sunlight. Not too hot, not too cold. These are essential to the process of seed growth. Given this nurturing environment, the seed pod eventually bursts and something called cellular respiration begins. The tiny seedling gains energy it needs to develop, unfold, and push up through the soil. Note, to push up or to push through could be termed a kind of endurance. After this point, germination is complete and the seedling can begin photosynthesis to gain energy. This will cause the seedling to straighten up into a tiny plant as it reaches for the sun. I am intrigued by this process and I collect, one of my hobbies, I collect and regularly plant seeds in my personal garden simply to enjoy seeing them emerge and grow. It is miraculous. I have often have, those of you who are my students know this, I often have my beginning Spanish students all in Spanish navigating this, I have them plant seeds, usually the first week of class, and usually I choose mammoth sunflowers, which I love, so that we as a class can witness easily observable physical growth. Typically seedlings sprout within a week, and by the end of the semester we have tall, blooming, glorious sunflowers to symbolize their growth as new language learners, growth that they may or may not see or quite yet feel in themselves. But as they continue, as you continue, you're out there, some of you, as you continue to nurture your language growth through various ways, 
you will grow in your capacity to both understand and communicate in your new language. We are like seeds. We have been planted on earth for a season, which we can call time. This time, this lifetime, or your time in college, this semester, or however you choose to frame your current season in life, this time is for us to live, to experience, to choose, to do, to seek, to struggle, to discover, to learn, to change, to overcome, to grow. This lifetime has been called a probationary state and a preparatory state. In the Book of Mormon, in the Book of Alma, we are taught. And thus we see that there was a time granted unto man to repent, yea, a probationary time, a time to repent and serve God. Probationary means a process of testing or observing the character or abilities of a person. Such a person is usually one who is new to a job, or in this case, when we're talking about life, new on earth with a new physical body and a new life to live. This probationary state became a state for them to prepare. It became a preparatory state. Honestly, it helps me to understand this doctrine of life, of time and of growth. Understanding the divine purpose of our time, living on this earth, helps me to live, to work through my challenges, and learn to endure. I'd like to speak for just a moment to those of you, maybe new international students, who are growing your English language and who are gathering new vocabulary. So I have this vocabulary for you. This verb I'm using here, and you will hear it a lot during this talk, is endure. And here are some of its meanings. To work and persist. To keep going with purpose. To remain firm under suffering or misfortune without yielding or giving up, even though it is difficult. To bear or wait out patiently. It can also mean to come to a knowledge of something by living through it. Coming to a knowledge through experience. In case you're curious, the noun forms up there are endurance and enduring. The adjective form is also enduring. Along these lines of enduring and pushing through and upwards like seeds in the earth, I would like to share just one of the ways I have learned physical and mental endurance in my lifetime. This learning started when I was, well, when we were, my husband and I, we're just a bit younger than many of you are now, many years ago. I will call this part running uphill. When my husband and I were teenagers, we met back then. Uh, between the ages of 15 and 18, we regularly ran up in these hills you see here behind me. These are what we call the foothills in Boise, Idaho, where we grew up. Far beyond them, these foothills grow into much larger mountains. These aren't the exact images I was hoping to find. We didn't actually take many pictures back then. No cell phones carrying around, no extra cameras or anything. So we just did. We, we ran, we experienced, and remembered. In my mind's eye, in my memory, I can still see a long, dusty dirt road curving up, hill after hill, three and a half miles up, to a certain ending place. This was a tradition, a regular weekly workout for our high school cross-country team in the summer and fall months, especially during August through October. Picture this, some 30 to 40 teenagers, girls and boys, on a hot, typically hot afternoon, running uphill, willingly. Why would we? Why did we do this? Well, it was our wonderful coach's plan to build our endurance, to increase our fitness, and to make us stronger in body and mind, to be better prepared to run and compete in future races, which typically were not all uphill, but rather on flat or more gentle rolling hill courses. And importantly, we were willing. We were obedient. 
We followed the workout plan. We wanted to be tougher, stronger, faster. In this process, we encouraged each other. Have you ever noticed the beautiful thing about memory is it often glosses or smooths over the struggle and pain actually felt in the living moment? So in the present moment of remembering, we don't really remember or feel how hard or painful some experience was. In this case, I can recall that running uphill in the heat was work, exertion, and sweat. It required determination and grit to do it. But what lingers for me is the feeling, the sense of overcoming, of arrival at the top, of achievement at completing the course, of meeting the challenge, and then, and this is the part I probably remember best, is the invigoration and the relaxation, even enjoyment, as we walked and jogged down as a large group of friends, talking and laughing, all the way back down to the bottom where we had started. Running uphill, so to speak, is an essential part of life. The struggle to push onward and upward through whatever life presents us is a hard, determined effort, certainly often with its discomforts and even sorrows, but not without rewards, even joys. In the Book of Mormon, in Mosiah 427, we read, it is not requisite that a man should run faster than he has strength. But I would add, it does seem requisite or necessary that we run in some form which doesn't necessarily mean actual running, but rather to do hard things, to exert ourselves for some good purpose. One of my favorite verses of scriptures relates to this idea. In the New Testament, in Hebrews, we read, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Let us run with patience the race. Again, for me, the idea to run in each of these means to exert ourselves, to work through, to endure for a good purpose, even if that purpose simply means wading through our circumstances or waiting on the Lord without knowing clearly for how long or for what reason exactly. I believe we each have a great ability to endure. But like with many other abilities, skills, capacities, talents, we need to exercise them, to develop them, so we can call upon them. I'm convinced that we need to choose to practice endurance in different ways, to learn to endure, again, with purpose, so that when we really need to be able to endure, when circumstances or conditions aren't necessarily our choosing, nor ideal or desirable, we will be better able to meet the challenge to work through difficulty and endure well. So now I would like to share an ancestor story, a story of endurance. I have had this picture you see there in my possession for many years. It is one of my great-grandmothers. She is my father's father's mother, so my great-grandmother. Her name is Jane Hewitt Johnson. Her parents met in Virginia during the United States Civil War in the years 1861 to 1865. Her parents were on opposite sides of that war. Her father, as a young man, was a Union soldier, and her mother, the daughter of Confederate plantation and slave owners. But those two fell in love during that war and married as soon as it ended. Shortly after, they moved away to start their life anew in another state, in southern Missouri. And my great-grandmother Jane was born there in a place called Hickory County, just a little place, in 1873. That was 90 years before I was born. 
I never knew her. But I've been captivated by this rare photo of her that someone took. I am grateful to have it. I don't know much about her life, only bits and pieces, but I know that I am part of her and she a part of me. Her story is part of mine. This image of her speaks to me of loneliness and difficulty and endurance. Her husband, Frank, my great-grandfather, was what in those days was called a freighter with a few horses and a wagon in a time before there were cars and trucks. To support his family, he followed the grain harvest across the country, sometimes traveling as far as Montana to haul supplies and goods and to help with the harvest. When the harvest season started, Frank was gone from home for months on end, leaving Jane in charge of their children, humble home and farm in Missouri. One November, on his trip home with his horses and wagon, Frank got caught in a cold and heavy rainstorm that lasted several days. As a result, he caught pneumonia and suddenly died. Jane was 37, with three children. The youngest, my grandfather, was just a year and a half old. I have wondered how she managed. I imagine this picture was taken after the loss of her husband. It speaks more than words how difficult it must have been. A family story says she cleared 40 acres of land all by herself, by hand, with a simple grubbing hoe in order to plant food and support her little family. She continued with her children in poverty, scratching out an existence there for years before eventually migrating to Idaho. My grandfather would often talk about being hungry and having no shoes as a boy. I recently learned something more about Jane's character. A few weeks ago, I emailed a cousin on my dad's side to see if he knew anything more about this great-grandmother of ours. Gratefully, this dear cousin took it to heart and quickly made time to talk with some other family members to see what they remembered about her. Again, no one knew a lot, but he was able to collect and record a few more family memories, and he emailed back to me what he had learned. One story he shared about her was that in those difficult years after Jane's own husband's death, one of their neighbor men died, and without anyone asking or saying anything, Jane volunteered for her oldest son to milk the widow's cow, which was essential for just the maintenance of any family back then. So twice a day, morning and evening, her boy would make a long trip on foot to the neighbor's farm to milk the cow. After quite a long time passed with him doing this, the widow neighbor told Jane she didn't need the boy's help anymore and offered to pay him for all the milking he had done. But Jane declined her offer and told the lady she'd make it right with her son. I learned something here about my great-grandmother, Jane. Having experienced great hardship and sorrow herself, she anticipated a need and showed compassion, sacrifice, and care for her neighbor. I'm really touched by that. From all the bits I have gathered of her, including the photo we saw, I know her life was hard, she was poor, and likely lonely. I don't know for sure what sustained her. As far as I am aware, she didn't have the resource of faith that I have, nor the sustaining and guiding power of baptismal and temple covenants, nor the steady, comforting influence of the gift of the Holy Ghost. I don't really know how she endured and kept moving in her lifetime, but she did. The little I do know of her inspires me to press forward amid my own life challenges. I'm grateful for her legacy of resilience and strength amid adversity and sorrow. I'm also grateful that I have been able to provide temple ordinances for her, which I believe provide her choice and opportunity to keep growing in her life beyond this world. This great-grandmother of mine, whom I never knew in person, has caused me to ponder and to seek to know something more about her to better understand in part myself and my family. As I have said, I've been inspired and encouraged by doing so. I've spent a lot of time talking about her, and it, she's been very meaningful. But at the same time, I've, I've reflected, 
it is so important to, to remember I have other people closer to me in my life experience that I have known and know better and love deeper who have had a more profound influence on me, who have nurtured, encouraged, helped, and inspired me continuously along my way. Here I would like to say a few words about my mother. My mother, Marie, is one of the most significant people in my life. She is the granddaughter of Italian immigrants. She is a talented artist. She is also a sower of seeds, a true gardener. And for me, she exemplifies love, gratitude, friendship, sensitivity to people and spiritual things, creativity, problem solving, and appreciation of nature's bountiful and diverse beauty. I would say that all of these ways are gifts of hers that she has cultivated and that I have learned from. But I think I have been most influenced by what I call her spirit of hopeful optimism. Let me say that again. Her spirit of hopeful optimism. I would describe this as an emotional thought and spiritual process and response, almost a trained reflex to life situations and challenges, big and small. It is a way in which one sees or perceives and then communicates hope and possibilities, usually in words followed by some action, but expresses these hope and possibilities to draw out the good in any, and I mean any, circumstance. <laughs> Though at times I humor and even weary my own husband and children with this relentlessly positive approach, as I find myself being like my mother in this way, I am ever grateful to her, my mother, for her ways which have given me capacities to face and endure difficulties and which to me bring to life the very words, a perfect brightness of hope. Another one of my favorite scriptures found in the Book of Mormon in 2 Nephi. Here it is. Wherefore, we must press forward with steadfastness in Christ having a perfect brightness of hope and a love of God and of all men. The resilient hope and love that I have learned both from my mother and that which I have learned from being a mother is a physical and spiritual and enduring love and commitment that is most powerful. I have learned that far beyond bearing, birthing, and early child-raising years, we carry our children with us all of our lives, even eternally, and we endure in hope for them. I hope you will think about your own mother right now. However well you know her, whatever her strengths or shortcomings, and we all have them, she carried you into this life. Bearing and birthing, as well as the ongoing caring for, nurturing, teaching, and continuous loving and hoping for are all special kinds of endurance in life. The words in the heart of the 13th article of faith written by the prophet Joseph Smith read, we have endured many things and hope to be able to endure all things. Note the slightly different emphasis on that word hope. This practice of hope helps us to live well and to be able to endure and grow. When we become part of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, as I did at age 20, or whenever we find we are converted, we become aware of and are connected to the long, enduring story of heaven and earth and that of our heavenly parents' family. We may have previously felt isolated and disconnected, but then discover this big picture, the long story, the truth of our pre-existence, our life before this life, of mortality, our current life, of prophets and prophecy, of agency, of repentance and forgiveness, of healing and salvation through the atonement of Jesus the Christ, and of life and growth and of resurrection after this life. We are part of God's long story. Our heavenly parents, our Savior, the Holy Ghost are in our story and we are in theirs. We are theirs. 
Our God's work is one of loving endurance for us. We know this from among the words that Jehovah spoke anciently to the prophet Moses, as recorded in the scriptures that we call the Pearl of Great Price. The words of God which he spake unto Moses at a time when Moses was caught up into an exceedingly high mountain. Jehovah says, For behold, this is my work and my glory, to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. In another time and place, recorded in the Book of Mormon, in his visit to the Nephites in the Americas, the then-resurrected Savior said, Behold, I am the law and the light. Look unto me, and endure to the end, and ye shall live. For unto him that endureth to the end will I give eternal life. Think about those words, endure to the end, to the end of the trail, to the top of the hill, to the solving of a problem, to the completion of a paper, a project, or exam, to the end of a semester, to the birth of a child, to the raising of a family, to the healing of an ailment or injury, to the end of our days of life, of mortality. This, whatever season we are in, give it your best effort to the end to follow him and his way. And we will be helped in both and we can help each other in both difficult and joyous times. Our Savior says for us to look unto him and endure to the end. The Savior himself is our teacher and example in this. We learn from him and his walk of life, of his ability to endure, leading up to his very real and great atoning sacrifice. One source says that Jesus walked 3,125 miles during his three-year ministry. And over his lifetime, one conservative estimate says the number of miles he walked was likely around 21,525 miles, almost the equivalent of walking around the entire world. I am not sure how accurate that is, but just think of him and his walking, just walking his movement in space and time. It takes time to live, to move through life. As the Savior lived on earth, he walked a lot. And from what I can discern, he was not in a hurry, though he was focused on his mission. He didn't seem rushed. He was calm amidst the storm because he knew his purpose and ours. We were and are his purpose. And he didn't just walk for exercise or just because he had to to get around. He walked places with purpose to connect with people, both individuals and groups, to teach, to heal, to love. When Jesus knew that his hour was come that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end, John 13, 1. The Savior himself said, also in John, as, this, as the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. The pure love Jesus Christ had and has for each of, and all of us, the complete combination of faith, hope and charity infuses his enduring mission for us as our Savior and advocate with Heavenly Father. And charity suffereth long and is kind and envieth not and is not puffed up, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, and rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. It may be, and I believe it is, that it is this love that really sustains us and provides us the source of our resilience and ability to press on. It is that long love that we can trust, that which continuously radiates to us from our God and teaches us to love others. And that love that we generate for others helps us grow that which we send out. Charity is the pure love of Christ. 
and it endureth forever. I find the spirit of endurance, the endurance that we must find for our lives in these words from Moroni on the final page of the Book of Mormon. You know them well, I believe. Yea, come unto Christ and be perfected in him and deny yourselves of all ungodliness. And if ye shall deny yourselves of all ungodliness and love God with all your might, mind, and strength, then is his grace sufficient for you, that by his grace you may be perfect in Christ. And if by the grace of God ye are perfect in Christ, ye can in no wise deny the power of God. Echoing this scripture in General Conference of April 1997, before many of you had arrived on this earth yet, our current and living prophet, Russell M. Nelson, then an apostle, said this, your responsibility to endure is uniquely yours, but you are never alone. I testify that the lifting power of the Lord can be yours if you will come unto Christ and be perfected in him. You will deny yourselves of all ungodliness, and you will love God with all your might, mind, and strength. I add my testimony to his. When we submit ourselves to growth experiences, such as when we choose to run uphill, or enroll in college and take the classes you're taking, or become parents and raise children, or many other things, including the choice to follow the living Christ as disciples. We plant ourselves in an environment, by choice, in which, in which we must meet opposition. We practice and learn to endure and overcome. I am convinced, again, I said this before, I am convinced that we need to prepare ourselves to better meet whatever the future holds by willingly exercising our ability to work with faith and hope and love and endure when we don't have to, so that when we really must, we are better able. As with the Savior's example, we are to learn to endure with purpose. And today, I encourage each of us to practice such endurance in this time that we have. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.